Okay, right. Very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Patrick Henningsen. Uh, from city venues and so forth, and the fact that you've all made the effort to come out here uh, means a lot to us, but it says a lot about you and a lot about there are people in this country and, and further afield that believe that this is a serious issue. And, uh, and, and the fact that you support the work of independent journalists and some of the great researchers and academics and persons uh, sitting here uh, behind me. Uh, and so I would give you a round of applause, <laughs> uh, firstly uh, and foremost. So thank you. So that's the big question. Why, why are we here? And I think the previous speakers uh, did a very, very good job of articulating that. Um, what I'm going to show you today is uh, I want to prove the concept a little bit. Um, amazing uh, setup here by my colleagues to lay the theoretical ground and also the moral and ethical ground to this important issue. What are the media doing? Are they serving us? Are they in fact a fourth estate? Uh, can you have a functioning democracy without a functioning fourth estate? Can you? So. We're, we're, we're told time and time again by our leaders that this is the gold standard of democracy. The United States, Western Europe, Britain is, is the gold standard of democracy and we're going to export those values to the world. We're told this time and time again. Uh, but really, how can we have a functioning democracy if you have to have meetings like this in secret, in, in, uh, you know, in a tent behind a community center? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, I, I, you wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have it any other way. I, I, I think, again, the, that you've all made the cause to be here, so have the speakers, and uh, our great organizer, Sheila, has made that cause, and, and it's all the more special that way. So we're here, all here because we think maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with the system. Maybe there's something wrong with this institution called the media, the press, the mainstream press. Here's some of the brands here that we all know and we all love, and uh, they're responsible for forming what is the consensus on any given issue. And there is no bigger issue than the issue of war, and the issue of intervention, and the issue of foreign policy, of what countries do in our name. And I'm not speaking to you as a journalist here. As, as my uh, colleague Tim Hayward said, I'm in the same category, I'm a citizen. I'm not a professional journalist. If, if people think what I do is professional, that's up to the audience. That's up to my readers to decide. Okay, I am first and foremost a person, a citizen, who is just concerned. Concerned about where all this public money is going. Concerned about wars being waged in my name, in my family's name, in my friend's and neighbor's name. I, I'm concerned about how that looks from the eyes of the Syrian, from the eyes of the Iraqi. And I've had the, uh, the experience this year, last year, of going to Iraq for the first time after living vicariously through these lenses here, which I'm showing you. And let me tell you, that was, uh, going to Syria was a, was a big wake-up call. But I, I, I knew what to expect because I had been to the Levant before. I traveled around uh, Lebanon, and I was familiar with the terrain and the people somewhat. But it was still a big shock. But going to Iraq was something else, uh, especially as, a, as, a, as someone who's born in America. And the role that my, the country, my country played in that conflict, destroying that country, ruining that country, and the complicity and the role which these institutions played, which has been outlined previously by my colleagues. Okay? That's very real. So you have to face these people when you go to this country, and, and you're wondering what they think of you, and, and the wonderful thing is they, they don't hold a grudge against you. They don't. Because people in the Middle East are smart enough to distinguish between the actions of government and the good people that live in this country, the good people that live in America, the good people all over the world who don't support these wars. The majority of the people don't support these wars. And I have proof of this because George W. Bush ran on a policy when he ran for president against Al Gore. No nation building. That swung the election for George W. Bush. Of course, that's not what happened during his eight years. Barack Obama 
ran on an anti-war ticket. I'm going to close Guantanamo Bay. We're take, bringing all the troops home. Day one, first thing I'm going to do. People loved it. Overwhelming support. Did he win by a landslide? Of course he did. Of course he did. Then comes Donald Trump. What turned the tide for Donald Trump? What separated Donald Trump from Hillary Clinton? Non-intervention. In anti-war, Donald Trump did exactly what Obama did. Exactly. And he did a version of what George W. Bush did. And because it, it works. Because the majority of people don't want this. E even people who aren't au fait with all of the detail and the nuance that we're presenting here, they still understand that. Okay? So it is true. So there's a big gap between media institutions, the political elite, and the public. There's a huge gap. We're talking about, in my opinion, a radical minority who are in charge, who are running narratives and running these agendas. Okay? It's a radical minority. They, they're powerful and they have a lot of influence, but the majority of the people don't support these. I am absolutely positive of it. Okay? So... This is, uh, you know, the, the lighting's not great here but because of where we are, but I'll run through these quickly. This is just a piece of propaganda here. This is a, a political cartoon from 1898, Spanish-American War. This is a depiction of a Spanish soldier who is standing on an American flag, hunkering on the graves of U.S. soldiers from the USS Maine. Okay? This was one of William Randolph Hearst's great achievements as the Rupert Murdoch of his day was the Spanish-American War. And so I'm just going to leave that with you because this will become significant uh, later on. But it's, it's a gorilla. It's an animal. This, they're depicting an animal, a Spanish somebody defiling the graves of U.S. patriots who gave their lives bravely in the sinking of the Maine. And that triggered the Spanish-American War. Okay. Palestine. Very simple example here. This is the BBC. This is actually from March, not from two weeks ago. Gaza-Israel border clashes, clashes, leave 16 Palestinians dead and hundreds injured. Clashes. This is the BBC. And they just died. They died in clashes. So this is a good example of what is the premier media outlet in this country who is dictating the narrative for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict situation. First of all, Palestinians did not die. They were shot. Some would say, this was sent to me by uh, Robert Inlakesh, who is a correspondent for Al-Mazdar News and a great advocate for Palestine. He, he said to me, Palestinians did not die. They were murdered by snipers from the IDF. These are unarmed protesters. These weren't clashes. Okay? And by the way, there's no border between Gaza and Israel. There's an illegally built fence, and there's walls in some areas, and these lines were drawn out by the United Nations, and Israel does not have declared borders, and they are occupying Palestinian territory. That's according to international law. What the media often do, whether it's in Israel, whether it's in Syria, is to create a, a dialectic or control a discourse whereby international law does not apply to certain players. And it generally doesn't apply to the actions of the United States and Israel, first and foremost. But also this could be extended to the UK and France, as we found out at the end of April with the tripartite airstrike against Syria. International law does not apply in this case. So these are exceptional countries. So this is essentially what's going on here. So, this is, is that propaganda? I'm not sure. But then this came out. Israel retaliates after Iran fires 20 rockets uh, at, at the Israeli army in the occupied Golan Heights. Now, all credit to the Guardian. They actually said occupied Golan Heights, which is more than I can say for the New York Times and the Washington Post and other mainstream outlets. So did Iran actually fire rockets into Israel? Is there any proof of this? But yet this was plastered across every single major media outlet, television, print, everything. It didn't happen. I can stand here and say I looked high and low for some, something that Iran fired rockets into Israel or even occupied Golan. And 
to, to my knowledge, I might be wrong, if anybody can help me produce some evidence, it didn't happen. The timing of this was interesting, however. This happened right at the same time the United States dumped the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal, withdrew from this deal, this international agreement. And this happened. So the timing is interesting. I'm not going to speculate any further than that. Syria. This, this is a good example. I don't know if anybody saw this story. This is Dr. Knott, Dr. David Knott. So he's a doctor. He's a surgeon who volunteers his time in war zones. And this story came out on March 21st, which was interesting, 2018. And he's talking about, he was doing a, uh, a live session on uh, the BBC. He was doing a uh, surgery with the M10 hospital in East Aleppo. This is uh, rebel-held or opposition-held East Aleppo. And this was in 2016. And he, he claimed that the Russians, in this article by the Telegraph, but also in the uh, BBC, the Russians, he thinks the Russians hacked his Skype and WhatsApp account to get his location and the location of this hospital, and they dropped a, a bunker buster bomb on the hospital as a result of that. That's what Dr. Knott believes. And this was reported and the timing of this was very interesting, just a few weeks before the Duma attack. Now, this is not newsworthy, for one, because it happened in 2016. Why is it surfacing in April? This is very interesting. But we, but we look a little bit further into this. And uh, so he believes that hackers were able to discover his location somehow uh, in his computer and managed to feed that information to the Russians, apparently. This is what he's inferring. So, so actually, I was at the M10 hospital, as you do, uh, a year ago with my colleague, Vanessa. And here's the M10 hospital. And I was on every floor of the M10 hospital. This is after it had been liberated uh, by the Syrian Arab army. I was on the top floor, the middle floor, and the basement. Okay, a bunker buster would take, would, would take the whole building out and then some. Okay, so I was in this, it, it, this has clearly been hit by artillery, no doubt, okay. Did, was, so did a bunker buster bomb land on this hospital? This is the question. Well, I've been there, uh, unlike the BBC journalists and the Telegraph journalists who are reporting the story, I've actually been there. And I'm showing you the pictures of it. I have m many more pictures of this, by the way, okay. And there's a lot of interesting things in this hospital, by the way. So... This was in East Aleppo, that's a year ago. So unless Assad and his henchmen did some redecorating really quick before we arrived and added the roof on, which I, don't, I wouldn't put it past the media to speculate that that would be the case. So here is a bomb that did land outside of the hospital. This is just uh, about 20 feet uh, from the hospital. I don't know which on, on which side in terms of northwest and uh, south and east, but... But this is interesting. This is inside the hospital. So this is Dr. Knott working in the M10 hospital in Al-Nusra-held East Aleppo at that time. And before that, ISIS-held East Aleppo. That's a fact. And this is on the wall. This is from the Libyan Revolutionary Council, right next to the Syrian American Medical Society logo, right next to uh, UOSS, the French umbrella, charity umbrella. And basically, if you translate this, and we've presented this on the UK column, this says, democracy is forbidden, okay? It's, it's haram. So this, this is posted in the hospital, and by many people's accounts, and certainly the people we spoke to in Syria, said that this hospital was also doing triage for fighters. This is the M10 hospital. So I'm not uh, accusing Dr. Knott of uh, working with uh, terrorist groups to patch up fighters and get them back on the field. I don't know the details of that, okay? What I am saying is that this is not an ordinary hospital. It didn't get hit with a bunker buster. And it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable to think that someone watching the BBC could have hacked his, by, by watching a segment on the news, could have found his accounts and hacked them and then worked out the location of who he was speaking to uh, on, on an encrypted network like WhatsApp. Or, I mean, it's just too much. And this came out right before Duma. Okay? Yeah. So, so here he is, David Knott. And uh, so following, working, following this incident, he's saying that people working in war zones shouldn't, I, I shouldn't be doing this now online. No more surgeries over the Internet. 
And I just was thinking, all you need to do is use a VPN and uh, maybe change your name on Skype. And there's no way anybody could find you by watching a BBC segment, okay? So this, this idea that he can't do this now uh, is ridiculous. Okay, now even then the Newsnight, uh, John Sweeney from the BBC weighed in and said, did the Russians and Syrians bomb this hospital in Aleppo because of our BBC Newsnight film with the Knott Foundation? It's so sickening, this act of inhumanity. This is the BBC weighing in, adding a little bit on top of the righteous indignation which is already being conveyed in this particular media article. So, and he, but then later the BBC kind of admits later in the article, towards the bottom, uh, the bombing of the M10 hospital was a tragedy, but we haven't seen any actual evidence to suggest that it was linked to the Newsnight report or any of the work that David and his good team have done. Okay, so even the BBC later admits that, but you can see the impression's already been put out on the front of the Telegraph to newsstands across the country, across the BBC, copied by the Independent, copy and pasted by a number of other mainstream media networks cascading all over the place. So, were there Russian hackers? No, probably not. There's, well, there's no evidence of it anyway. This is just his idea. So that's not a news story, okay? Uh, was there a bunker buster bomb? No, there wasn't. Uh, was this an opposition hospital? Well, this was in al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Syria held East Aleppo, and they were in control of this hospital. And I would say, is this corporate media propaganda? I would say yes. I would say yes, it is. Is this fake news? Yes. I can say, I can say this is fake news. And I'm happy for anybody to refute my uh, horrible allegation there. So, so the, uh, one of the points brought about this meeting, which obviously has attracted a lot of controversy, is uh, are there any responsibilities by journalists and media outlets uh, in terms of their proximity with terrorist groups, are they uh, putting forward a terrorist narrative? Is this something to be concerned about? Is this potentially uh, playing fast and loose with uh, terrorism laws, for instance? Okay, uh, this is a good question. Here's Clarissa Ward standing in. Uh, I've stood in this very spot. Uh, this is very close to the uh, the green line between West and East Aleppo, and uh, so she's here. And she's giving her report behind enemy lines. She won all kinds of awards, including the Peabody Award. And uh, here's, I'll go back to her in a minute. Here's Michael Wise. Uh, he did a great story here. Women in Aleppo choose to commit suicide uh, instead of being raped by Syrian soldiers as East Aleppo was being liberated or as it was falling, as CNN and others like to, to put it. So this is Michael Wise, former... Communications Director of the Henry Jackson Society, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council, which is a NATO-linked think tank, and NATO-funded, funded by the defense industry. Uh, senior Editor of the Daily Beast, Special Contributor for CNN, the biggest news network in the United States. This is him. This is his story, which he authored. So women were, cr were committing mass suicide to avoid being gang-raped by Syrian soldiers marauding through as they liberated East Aleppo. This went out on the airwaves in the United States, on CNN, prime time, okay? So I was watching this as my colleague was there, okay? So I knew from her reports one story, and I'm seeing something very different on the mainstream media. So his source was arguably, according to him, the Levant Front. This is considered by many an Al-Qaeda affiliate. It's, you could say a terrorist organization. They might not be on the official list, but they're there. So he said, earlier today I was speaking with the consultative, consultative council of the Levant Front. This was on CNN, on Don Lemon. This was Michael in December 2016. So he's talking with them. They're feeding him this information, putting these stories out. And you look at his background, bear in mind who he works for, okay? So this was during a panel discussion. The Levant Front, that name sounded so familiar to me, and I, then I remembered. This is Tulsi Gabbard from the 2nd District of Hawaii. She put forward the Stop Terrorism Act in December of 2016 in the United States. And one of the groups which she mentioned in terms of these terrorist organizations was right there, was the Levant Front. Okay, So this is recognized 
uh, widely in the United States at a legal level that this is a terrorist or a terrorist affiliate organization. That's CNN's source, feeding what is arguably, well, to me, definitely a fake news story, which I showed you from the BBC. That's designed for you to be very angry at the Syrian army and for you to back whatever measures it takes to take them out of power and get rid of President Assad and so forth. So, and there's a number of these award-winning journalists. Here's Hadi Abdullah, who won the 2016 Reporters Without Borders Award. And he's very well embedded with, well, there he is, uh, with Abdullah al-Musini, who is the head of al-Qaeda in Syria. And that's a kind of a friendly photo there. This is just one of many, by the way. Okay, so that's re recognized by Reporters Without Borders, who, by the way, uh, when my colleague Vanessa Bealey was making a presentation about the White Helmets at the Swiss Press Club late last year, who tried to get that event shut down, am I wrong, was Reporters Without Borders. They're meant to be looking out for the rights of journalists internationally and protecting free speech, and they're shutting down just like this event was being shut down. So there he is. Here she is, another award-winning CNN journalist in full garb, Clarissa Ward. And she did this behind the scenes. Uh, there's her, I don't know if that's her salary or not, but she's well paid. Here she is with the rebels. So really glorifying their cause. Uh, that's my opinion. That's how I view this sort of... Uh, in, in. Who's this man with her? That, that's a guy named Bilal Abdul Karim. That's her fixer in East Aleppo. Bilal Abdul Karim with Clarissa Award right there. That's the award-winning segment by CNN. This was the big award-winning segment. Okay. Here he is again with another award-winning British journalist, uh, Iona Craig, who writes for The Intercept, Chatham House, International Crisis Group, and she's co commending him on what a great job he's doing as a journalist. This was on a Facebook Live interview last year. I found that to be a little bit interesting, considering a lot of people consider Bilal to be an al-Qaeda propagandist. And here he is, this is the New York Times saying, reporting from Syria, an American with a point of view and a message. That's all he is. He's embedded with al-Qaeda, but he's just got a point of view and a message. And here he is, showing off a suicide belt from this fighter who is well covered, who is of a very light complexion, by the way. Uh, and I'll leave it there, but it's in East Aleppo right here. And this was given heavy rotation in the U.S. mainstream media, so this is designed to characterize these people as rebels, as people you might sympathize with uh, in their cause to overthrow the dictator uh, Bashar al-Assad. And here he is, really upset, and filing a case against the U.S. government for putting him on a drone kill list. So uh, poor uh, Bilal. And uh, so here's the, the image of the ape. Remember I showed you this at the beginning of the presentation. Assad is an animal. Trends among Syrian social media users after Donald Trump's comments. Okay, Assad is an animal. This is essentially how it's being characterized. But, but it wasn't Trump who started this, by the way. Other people weighed in on it. These are images from different magazines and newspapers of Assad as an animal, different types of animals, a jackal, a buzzard, here he is standing on a pile of skulls. These are just a few, by the way. If you do a search, you can find it's quite an extensive portfolio of uh, images of this man, Bashar al-Assad. It must be an animal. This is very important, by the way, the dehumanization of leaders of target nations if you want to sell uh, whatever the policy is, especially if it's a military policy. You'll feel a lot better if the person that's being attacked is a bad guy. Certainly that worked with Saddam Hussein, who was a bad guy, by uh, I, I, many Iraqis' estimation, but uh, this has been repeated over and over with many other countries. So here's the BBC uh, talking about the Syrian rebels here, and of course there's uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, just rebels, by the way, not terrorists, according to the BBC. So Assad gets quite a heavy treatment by the media, but al-Nusra and al-Qaeda, they don't because they are fighting him and being backed, like these other groups, by some U.S. sources and Gulf sources. And, uh, and here is, I'll, I'll end it with this story, because I think this is interesting. The refugee crisis, the BBC are shadowing this young man, Zachari Zachariah, who's, who's leaving Germany now, and he's trying to go back to Syria. He's abandoned Europe, he's returning to Syria. They're following him on his journey home. 
But we were told for six years that these people were fleeing Syria to flee the evil Assad. But Assad's still uh, in power. The Syrian government is, is now taking control of most of the country. And there are hundreds of thousands of people going back to Syria. And something's wrong with this narrative over the last six years. The truth is now outing the narrative that has been foisted upon us for six years. Events, real events, natural occurring events are now vindicating all of the people who've been telling the truth for the last six years. And, but the BBC have kind of spun this very nicely, okay? And uh, last but not least, I just want to uh, say, I was gonna talk about Alex Thompson, but that was covered by the previous speaker. Um, there are good mainstream media journalists and I will compliment them and do uh, whenever they do great reports. Even if they did 100 bad reports before, I'm still going to say good job, thank you for that accurate and fair report. Um, but likewise, if there's a report that's inaccurate, that is propaganda, uh, I will criticize it. But for criticizing it, we have been attacked. We have been demonized for criticizing mainstream media coverage. Think about the billions of dollars they have at their disposal in terms of uh, assets, resources, collectively. We're talking about all of these, com all of this here. We're talking about 20, 30 billion capitalized in terms of assets and resources. We have nothing. We don't earn money or earn a living uh, from doing this, I can tell you right now. Okay? But, and, and we don't have a media footprint to generate billions of media impressions that all of these people do. But for some reason, the big scourge or the big threat to our democracy is fake news stories floating around Facebook. But yet the fake news produced by these people, by these organizations, is somehow not a threat to democracy? I think the story's somehow been inverted. I think, and I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. That's, that's the message I'm trying to get across, okay? The burden of proof should be on these organizations to prove the claims they make, to prove the, the stories they're drifting out to get you to back whatever the policy of the day is. But at the moment, they're putting the burden of proof on uh, independent media people who don't have nearly the power and influence that they have. And for some reason, they're scared of us. I don't know why, but that's, that's what it is. So that's my uh, presentation for today. But uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I will yield any time left to the next speaker. Thank you. <laughs>